This is a talk that I gave at the Science and Non-Duality Conference in San Jose, California in September 2015. Uh, I put a lot of thought into the talk and it was something I had to read rather than speak out extemporaneously because there were so many details and so many quotes and I thought you might enjoy it. Um, it wasn't recorded very professionally. Uh, at the last minute a friend brought in her camcorder um, and as you can see sometimes I'm off camera and I was also pressed for time because I only had 45 minutes and I really needed at least an hour if not more so I had to cut some things out. Uh, I'm going to add those things in this rendition of the talk and it'll be obvious that I'm sitting here and not at the conference but it makes the thing more complete and I want to express gratitude to my friend Ralph Preston who has done all the video post-production for Bat Gap ever since the beginning and uh, he hasn't done so yet at this moment but I'm sure he's going to spend a lot of time putting in all the graphics that I uh, wanted the audience to see during my talk. So thanks for watching and if it jumps to me sitting here in my yellow shirt instead of at the conference you now know why. Thanks. I met Rick in 1980 at the TM Center in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. And then, you know, things took on a, uh, in my life, changed very rapidly after that. I met uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and it's a long story that I won't go into today. But then Rick was at that time teaching meditation. He wasn't my instructor, but he was close to the family. Then we had a big conference in India. <coughs> And he stayed at our home and got to be very close with my parents. And so I lost track of him after I left the organization. And then we met here again two years ago. So he's a very long time experiential explorer of consciousness. I look upon him as a very wise person. And, you know, there are two kinds of uh, uh, things happening at this conference. A lot of it is intellectual, which is exciting, I like that. But a lot of it is very experiential, and I think Rick comes from both places. So I'm honored to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you very much. I just want to say, Deepak, that if I end up benefiting people's lives 5% as much as you already have, I would consider my life to have been well lived. <laughs> and also, since I co-taught the course in which Deepak learned to meditate, that kind of puts him in my <laughs> down line. <laughs> Go, <laughs> so as I was about to say earlier, uh, tomorrow night I'll be in the main hall, I'll be facilitating a conversation between Deepak and Rupert, not that they need much facilitation, about whether matter actually exists. And uh, spoiler alert, it doesn't. <laughs> so you've all heard the Upanishadic expressions, aham brahmasmi, I am that, tatvamasi, you are that, and sarvam kalvidam brahma. Oh, this is that. If these expressions are true, and if we take non-duality seriously, then it may appear that I'm standing here talking to you, and you're sitting there listening to me, but in reality, there's only consciousness interacting with itself, <clears throat> giving rise to apparent forms and phenomena, and hiding its true nature from itself in the subjective experience of those forms. In other words, we are the divine having a human experience. We're sense organs of the infinite, instruments of the divine, instruments of God, People often thank me for doing that gap, and I appreciate the thanks, but in a very real sense, I don't feel like I'm doing it. It's more like I'm being done. If a paintbrush could talk, it, would, it wouldn't say, I paint. It would say, I apply paint where the hand guides and directs me. So during my decades of teaching meditation, and more recently doing, during, doing that gap, I've often felt like an instrument of something much larger and wiser than my individuality. And I'm sure we can all relate to this in our own ways, and the reason I have this slide here is this, this sentiment was expressed beautifully in the prayer of St. Francis. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon, and so on. But I'm not comparing myself to St. Francis. Um, deer, rabbits run away from me. Birds fly away. <laughs> and also, my motivation has never been 
purely altruistic. I've always been zealous about spiritual evolution as much for my own happiness as well as for what good I might do in the world. In the early days, my attitude was, I want enlightenment more than anything, and I'll do anything to get it. And I think you can all see the absurdity in that phraseology. But in 1972, uh, based on that attitude, when my teacher said that if you're really serious about enlightenment, you should become a monk, I abruptly and callously broke up with my girlfriend, sorry Donna, wherever you are, <laughs> and embarked on a 15-year monastic phase. One of the incentives during this period was that one of these days we were all going to end up living in an ashram in the Himalayas. <laughs> this is a view from my friend's balcony in that ashram. And uh, this is another friend who lives there. His name happens to be Atmananda Atli. And um, recently Atmananda, Atmananda emailed me to say, there is a beautiful sadhu in Gangotri who loves your Buddha the gas pump stuff. He lives in Gangotri year round, much of the time with no electricity. His kutya, his little hut buried in snow. But somehow he found your site and he loves it. Now, Gangotri is a tiny village high in the Himalayas near where the Ganges emerges from a glacier. So in a roundabout way, I'm in the Himalayas. <laughs> and a lot of other places, serving as an instrument of the divine, not in the way I originally envisioned, but in a way for which I'm better suited and more useful. So that was all presented from kind of an individual perspective, and we're going to consider another perspective in a moment. But first, part one of my talk. That was just the prelude. <laughs> so this is the Science and Non-Duality Conference. We bring together both the scientific and the spiritual traditions of gaining knowledge, because the highest expressions of both realize that ultimately there is one non-dual reality appearing as diversity. At this conference, we're considering whether both traditions are talking about the same ultimate reality, not that there could be more than one, uh, and how we can know or experience it. If science and spirituality are both about understanding reality, then they should be on the same team. They should concur about a lot of things, and for both, experientially verifiable evidence should be the arbiter of truth. Science fiction writer Philip K. Dick said, reality is that which, when you stop believing it, doesn't go away. I might add that believing in something doesn't make it real. Scientists are not concerned about belief. They don't say, believe my theory or I'll blow you to bits and you'll burn in hell for all eternity. <laughs> Rather, they say, here's a prophecy theory. My research supports it. See if yours does. In fact, see if you can refute it. The highest forms of spirituality do the same. The Upanishads and similar scriptures don't ask for belief. They describe deeper realities that people have experienced and invite the reader to experience them as well. On the other hand, science has given us the means to blow everyone to bits. Um, and real spirituality on a mass scale is critically needed to prevent us from doing that. The best scientists and spiritual aspirants have a lot in common. The best scientists arrive at their insights through deep intuitive knowing and then work out the details intellectually and experientially. The clearest spiritual realizers cultivate their realization systematically, scientifically, proceeding carefully by steps of knowledge and experience. If science adopted the best of spirituality and vice versa, both paths of gaining knowledge would be greatly enriched, and this conference is an opportunity to do just that. Now, for a long time, religion has been the predominant expression of spirituality in the world. Religions spring from the experience of some sage who is a living embodiment of truth, but even in his lifetime, most people don't understand him because they don't share his level of experience. After his death, his message gets more and more distorted. Lacking the means to provide the experience their founders had, religions advocate belief, and unverifiable beliefs tend to clash. Hundreds of millions of people have been tortured and killed over the distorted remnants of what started out as the most sublime experience a human being can have. So belief, not corroborated by experience, can be delusional and dangerous. Science and a scientific approach can help restore experience rather than belief as the foundation of religion and spirituality. Carl Sagan said, how is it that hardly any major religion has looked at science and concluded, this is better than we thought. The universe is much bigger than our prophets said, grander, more subtle, more elegant. Instead they say, no, 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 my God is a little God and I want him to stay that way. A religion, old or new, that, ex that stressed the magnificence of the universe as revealed by modern science might be able to draw forth reserves of reverence and awe hardly tapped by the conventional faiths. Something of this nature seems to be happening. People everywhere are waking up. They aren't satisfied with mere belief. They want direct experience. 
Many of them are leaving traditional religions, others are breathing new life in, into those religions, and many regard science as modern-day revelation, which is why conferences like this exist. Erwin Schrodinger said, the more deeply physics probes, the more unified nature becomes. Quantum physics thus reveals the basic oneness of the universe. <clears throat> Max Planck, the founder of quantum theory, said, I regard consciousness as fundamental. I regard matter as derivative from consciousness. We cannot get behind consciousness. Everything that we talk about, everything that we regard as existing, postulates consciousness. So the most advanced physicists equate this basic oneness, which they may call the unified field, the vacuum state, with consciousness. I'll use such terms as unified field, consciousness, God, and Brahman interchangeably in this presentation. Richard Dawkins isn't here, is he? <laughs> <laughs> Physics tries to discover more fundamental laws of nature through objective methodologies. Because the physicist uses external tools, he can never overcome the subject-object split. At best, he can aspire to, to gain a mathematical understanding of non-dual reality, supported by evidence from massive particle accelerators and other tools. In other words, he can achieve some intellectual understanding of the unified field, but cannot experience his true nature as that field. But, if the ultimate nature of reality is consciousness, then what instrument can be better suited to exploring it than the human nervous system? It reflects consciousness much more capably than a particle accelerator. Using the nervous system as an exploratory tool through subjective methodologies such as meditation, one can transcend the subject-object split and experientially realize one's true nature as the ultimate non-dual reality. This tool is also much more public, publicly accessible. We can't all get PhDs in physics and gain access to particle accelerators, but we all have nervous systems. <clears throat> okay, here's part two of my talk, and this is really the heart of it. If everything is consciousness, and then the qualities we see displayed in the world must somehow reveal qualities of consciousness. <coughs> 19th century Hasidic master Menachem Nahum said, the Creator's glory fills the whole earth. There is no place devoid of Him. But His glory takes the form of garb. God is garbed in all things. This aspect of div divinity is called Shekinah, indwelling, since it dwells in everything. The Bible said, for what can, what can be known about God is plain to people because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clear, clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So I'd like to consider some of the qualities that consciousness is supposed to have and see whether science can help us detect those qualities in the things that have been made in the world around us. And the first is that it's everything. Everything is it. Advaita, non-duality, tells us that that which may appear physical is actually consciousness, appearing to assume physical forms. Physics tells us that apparently physical stuff is all the same non-physical reality, appearing to assume different forms. It's fundamental. Materialists argue that consciousness is an epiphenomenon of brain functioning that ends when the body dies. But physics understands the unified field to be fundamental. The brain and everything else arises from it. Advaita says the same thing of consciousness. It's eternal and indestructible. The Bhagavad Gita says, Know that to be indeed indestructible by which all this is pervaded. If everything is consciousness or the unified field, then forms may come and go, but their true nature remains unchanged. One of the traditional metaphors is gold, taking the form of various ornaments. Dorothy just used that this morning. Um, earrings can be melted down to form rings, but it's really just the same gold assuming different forms. The gold itself is indestructible. It's all pervading. There is no place or thing, near or far, large or small, which cannot be found to be anything other than which can be found to be anything other than consciousness. It's not that consciousness permeates creation the way water permeates a sponge. Consciousness is both the water and the sponge. There is no distinction. There's a song that goes, God is watching us from a distance. Not so. God or consciousness can't be distant from anything. How can it be distant from itself? Every molecule, cell, body, star, and galaxy is governed perfectly, not by consciousness or God, as a puppeteer governs a puppet, or as a clockmaker makes a clock and then winds it up and lets it run, but as consciousness or God interacting with itself. If God were distant, then he wouldn't be omnipresent, and it's obvious he's omnipresent because everywhere we look or can imagine looking, there he is, infinite intelligence on display. It's self-referral. If consciousness is all that exists, then it has nothing other than itself with which to interact. 
in terms of physics, the unified field refers to or becomes aware of or interacts with itself because there's nothing else down there for it to interact with. This self-interaction causes relative expressions such as force and matter fields to emerge. These, in turn, give rise to elementary particles as manifestation proceeds. The Vedas outline a parallel process, and the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna, who is said to have been an avatar, the absolute in human form, says, Prakritim svama vastabhya vishrujami puna puna. Curbing back on my own nature, I create again and again. So in other words, the self-interaction of the absolute, of consciousness, gives rise to the apparent material creation. It's intelligence. Consciousness is sometimes presented as silent and qualityless, but the more mature spiritual traditions regard it as both infinitely silent and infinitely dynamic, as the repository of all qualities, among them intelligence and creativity. The vast complexity of every bit of creation is beyond our comprehension and far beyond our computational abilities. Scientists don't have much to say about how the complexity and orderliness of nature is actually managed. Uh, physicist Paul C. Davies says, to be a scientist you had to have faith that the universe is governed by dependable, immutable, absolute, universal mathematical <coughs> laws of an unspecified origin. You've got to believe that these laws won't fail, that we won't wake up tomorrow to find heat flowing from cold to hot, or the speed of light changing by the hour. Over the years, I have often asked my physicist colleagues why the laws of nature are what they are. Their favorite reply is, there's no reason they are what they are, they just are. They are what they are because consciousness is pure intelligence, and the laws of nature are impulses of intelligence, and I'm going to talk about more about that in a minute. Einstein said, contemplate the mystery of conscious life perpetuating itself through all eternity to reflect upon the marvelous structure of the universe which we can dimly perceive and try humbly to comprehend even an infinitesimal part of the intelligence manifested in nature. If we acknowledge intelligence as a primary quality of consciousness, then spirituality can help scientists understand what they now regard as a miracle and a mystery, and science can help spiritual seekers see that everything is consciousness. Science tells us that in every cubic centimeter anywhere in the universe, innumerable laws of nature are functioning flawlessly and in perfect coordination with one another. Spirituality tells us that those laws are clear evidence of the omnipresence of intelligence. It, there's supposed to be something like 40, between 40 and 100 trillion cells in the human body. And so if that's the case, if you look at your finger, there are probably billions in your finger alone. And uh, as Carl Sagan put it, a single cell contains the equivalent information content of over 10 billion volumes. Um, there are, e each of these cells is about as complex as Tokyo, but it, only a few microns across, and each contains about 100 trillion atoms, each capable of repairing and, not the atoms, but the cells, each capable of repairing and reproducing itself. Does that sound like randomness or chance to you? There are 20 elements in amino acids that combine in certain sequences to form the 700,000 kinds of proteins in our body. To make just one of these proteins, collagen, you need to arrange 1,055 amino acids in precisely the right sequence. If this had to happen by chance, it would be like a Las Vegas slot machine with 1,055 spinning wheels, each with 20 symbols, and you had to get the same symbol on all the wheels to win the jackpot. <coughs> the odds of achieving this through chance are far greater than the number of atoms in the universe. And that's just one of 700,000 proteins. Next quality. It's orderly. It's not random or chaotic. Nature's laws are perfectly orderly. Nothing is random, accidental or arbitrary. The mathematics of something called chaos theory, in which seemingly random events are actually predictable from simple deterministic equations. As theologian R.C. Sproul put it, if there's even one maverick molecule in the universe, there is no God. For all the talk of random selection in Darwinian theory, many scientists recognize that life could not have come into existence by mere chance. Astronomer Fred Hoyle said, the chance that higher forms have emerged in this way is comparable to the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard might assemble a Boeing 747 from the materials therein. So, and even inanimate creation is not random or accidental. I hope this video plays, but let's take something that may seem random and consider how it's not rocks in the tumble. Or better yet, if the video plays. That wasn't a laser blast, something hit us. Han, get up here. Come on, Chewie! Asteroids. Chewie, set 271. Uh, what are you doing? 
talking about actually going into an asteroid field. They'd be crazy to follow us, wouldn't they? do this to impress me. Sir, the possibility of successfully navigating an asteroid field is approximately 3,720 to 1. Never tell me the odds. So the movements of the tumbling asteroids are not random. They're in perfect accord with gravitational and other laws of Newtonian physics. Our most powerful computers couldn't compute all the variables involved, but all pervading intelligence has no trouble doing so. Another thing, when the guy flying the TIE fighters goes flat into the asteroid, it was in accordance with the laws of karma. His karma... <laughs> His karma, and uh, that of Han Solo and the other beings in the, in the Millennium Falcon. We can debate later on whether droids have karma. You were stuck in the first chapter. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to go on to the next slide. Um, the Bhagavad Gita says, Gahana karmani gati, unfathomable are the laws of karma. They're unfathomable by human intellect because they're infinitely complex. But the infinite all pervading intelligence doesn't break a sweat in ministering the karma of trillions of beings throughout the universe. There. It's a field of infinite energy and potential. Physicists say that the level of the vacuum state, in, at the level of the vacuum state, a single cubic centimeter of empty space contains more energy than is displayed in the entire manifest universe. We're swimming in an ocean of subtle energy of such immense power that it is virtually incomprehensible. The Big Bang is happening constantly. As cosmologist Brian Swim put it, the universe emerges out of an all-nourishing abyss not only 14 billion years ago, but in every moment. In our own experience, when we realize our true nature is pure consciousness, we become conduits to whatever degree our physiology is capable of infinite energy and intelligence. It's infinitely correlated. Last year's conference was about entanglement, how two entangled particles a galaxy apart can communicate instantly with one another. Infinite correlation would mean that since everything is consciousness, and consciousness is not segmented or bound by space and time, every bit of creation is intimately and directly connected to every other bit. This helps to explain the realm of psychic and extrasensory phenomena and precognition, things like that. This is a good one. Contact with it is blissful, fulfilling. The scientific relevance of this is that some scientists are seeking to understand the neurophysiology and neurochemistry of the blissful nature of enlightenment. You've heard the, the phrase Satchitananda, which means absolute bliss consciousness. Consciousness is bliss, or at least contact with it is. Um, the Upanishads say, contact with Brahman is infinite joy. Taittiriya Upanishad says, out of bliss these beings are born, in bliss they are sustained, and to bliss they go and merge again. If life doesn't seem blissful, then perhaps we're not connected with its source clearly enough. The Brahma Sutras say, Anandamayo Vyasat, with regular practice, that becomes blissful. So bliss is one of the perks of realizing our true nature as Brahman or totality, and can even be thought as a litmus test of it, but it might take regular practice to cash in on that. Knowing ourselves is that eliminates fear. The Upanishads state, clearly all fear is born of duality. You are a wave, but the wave is the same water as the rest of the ocean, just stirred up a bit. If experience if we experience ourselves as only a wave, we are isolated, short-lived, vulnerable, and at the mercy of forces we don't understand or control. If we know ourselves as the ocean, then we live primarily as that, secondarily as a wave. We abide in a felt sense of timelessness, immortality. The Gita again states that even a little of the practice of uniting with the eternal indestructible reality delivers from great fear. Oh, that was the fear one. Okay. It's us. It's what we are. Again, most fundamentally, you are pure consciousness, the intelligence permeating, containing, and governing the universe. If that's ultimately all there is, then what else can it be? It's the home of all the laws of nature. All the laws of nature governing creation reside within consciousness. The, terms law, the term laws of nature has an impersonal mechanical connotation. We refer to gravity, electromagnetism, etc. as laws of nature. But if everything is consciousness, intelligence, 
then these laws and all others must be made of intelligence, impulses of intelligence or consciousness. Plato described the universe as a single living creature that encompasses all living creatures within it. If we think of it that way, then the laws of nature are like specific currents of intelligence flowing within the ocean of intelligence, performing various functions. In the Vedic tradition, these currents are understood as devas, which is crudely translated as gods. The Rig Veda says, Richo akshare parme vyaman yasmin deva adivishve nishe du. Part of that means all the devas, the impulses of creative intelligence, the laws of nature responsible for the whole manifest universe, reside in the transcendental field. If you know yourself as that field, then you live as the home of all the laws of nature. All the impulses of intelligence governing creation reside within you. Your thoughts and actions tend to align with them, so they support you. If you do not know yourself as that, then you are estranged from those laws. You tend to act in opposition to them, so they oppose you, and you experience obstacles of suffering. The Bhagavad Gita says, He who has conquered his self by himself alone is his own friend, but the self of him who has not conquered his self will behave with enmity like a foe. Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas said, If you bring forth that which is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth that which is within you, what you do not bring will destroy you. Part 3. If everything is consciousness, does it follow that everything is conscious? And to what degree? So there's a Sufi saying, God sleeps in the rock, dreams in the plant, stirs in the animal, and awakens in man. A rock is as much in consciousness and consciousness in it as is a human being. But rocks do not appear to be conscious in any meaningful sense. Yet at the, at the atomic and subatomic levels, looking at carbon atoms, for instance, a rock is indistinguishable from a human being. Some would argue that even at this level, nature is consciousness, is conscious. Uh, physicist and cosmologist um, Freeman Dyson writes that at the atomic level, matter in quantum mechanics is not an inert substance, but an active agent, constantly making choices between alternative possibilities. It appears that mind, as manifested by the capacity to make choices, is to some extent inherent in every electron. Plants are incredibly intelligent. Read Michael Pollan's recent New Yorker article, The, the Intelligent Plant. And it's obvious that animals are highly conscious, intelligent, and emotionally sensitive. These examples suggest that everything is conscious to some degree, but that that degree spans a vast range. The Sufis are not disputing that these forms are made of God. They're just saying that God, in and as forms, varies in the degree to which he recognizes and expresses the fullness of his nature. The more complex and sophisticated the physical structure, the more fully consciousness can be reflected. We see much more sophisticated, complex structures in living beings than in rocks. Structures capable of reflecting consciousness enough to be conscious, conscious that they are conscious, and in the enlightened, conscious that they are consciousness. <clears throat> God sleeps, dreams, and stirs in the rock, plant, and animal because they don't have brains and nervous systems capable of enabling consciousness to be fully awake to itself. But human beings do. It's just a matter of taking full advantage of the instrument in our possession. <clears throat> Albert Einstein said, he, can, he who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead. Kurt Vonnegut said, I don't know about you, but I practice disorganized religion. I belong to an unholy disorder. We call ourselves Our Lady of Perpetual Astonishment. <laughs> Most of us don't go through our days wrapped in awe or astonished. Um, why is that? William Blake, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. Our perceptual abilities are dull and our hearts are numb, so we tend to perceive only the surface value of everything around us and within us. Spiritual practice refines the nervous system and cleans our doors of perception. You might ask, if we know ourselves as infinite intelligence, will we know everything? Well, I know what Francis Bennett is thinking right now, uh, but I want to. <laughs> sure, it's possible. Um, the more we refine our faculties of knowing, the more we can know. But the human instrument is not designed for omniscience. Um, it's said that it takes a celestial body for that. As sense organs of the infinite, we are filters, lenses, conduits. The electrical field powers all light bulbs, but no individual light bulb can illumine the world. If it tried to do so, it would burn out. There's a scene in the 11th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita where, Lord Krishna, where Arjuna begs Lord Krishna to show him his divine form. Essentially, he's asking for omniscience. 
And Lord Krishna says, no, 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 you can't handle it. He says, come on, please. And, <laughs> and so Bhagavan said, okay. Krishna says, okay, you asked for it. And the rest of the chapter is basically Arjuna begging him to take the vision away because it's too much for him to handle. <laughs> okay, leave Krishna there for a minute. So now that we've established that in essence we are the totality, the infinite intelligence permeating and containing everything, that science offers evidence that we are that, and that we can know ourselves as that through spiritual practice, I want to switch gears and tell you a story. So when I was a little kid, I don't know, nine or ten, I got one of those diseases that we all got in those days that make headlines when kids get them today, like chicken pox or something like that. And I had a high fever, and the fever somehow triggered in me a fascinating experience that was so fascinating that I kind of forgot that I was sick, and I just sat there with my eyes closed exploring it. And the experience was one of infinite vastness and infinite tininess. Infinite vastness and infinite tininess, kind of simultaneously. Has anyone ever had an experience like that? Yeah. Either in a fever or meditation or ayahuasca or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so, years later, I became aware of this verse from the Kanta Upanishad. It says that the Atman, the self, smaller than the smallest, smaller than the small, greater than the great, is hidden in the hearts of all creatures. So, we don't just dwell in this body, we dwell in the hearts of all living creatures, and also non living, if you can draw that distinction. Lumi said, don't you know yet? It's your light that lights the worlds. <clears throat> Here's a verse from the Shvetashvara Upanishad. <laughs> you are a woman, you are a man, you are the youth and maiden too. You are the old man hobbling along with a staff. Once born, you are the face turned in every direction. You are the dark blue butterfly. You are the green parrot with red eyes. You are the thundercloud, pregnant with lightning. You are the seasons. You are the seas. You are without beginning, present everywhere. You from whom all worlds are born. I want to elaborate on this by showing you some large examples of large and small things. You've seen presentations like this before, but I want to, you to watch this one while keeping in mind that this is not something that's happening out there. It's happening within you, within consciousness, within infinite intelligence, God, Brahman, totality, permeating and pervading and perfectly orchestrating all these events. This is a, just a kind of an animation of the merger of the Andromeda and Milky Way galaxies. And imagine that you are observing this merger in real time as a silent, eternal witness, because you actually are. According to Drake's equation, everything I say about the Earth here is probably also true of thousands of intelligent civilizations throughout our galaxy and billions throughout the universe. This merger, if you can play it, will take place over 8 billion years, so I'm going to have to speed it up because we'll only have <laughs> Okay, so if we were to let what this thing actually shows is the galaxy is kind of spinning around and merging and wishing and you know, going every which way, you can imagine it. So if we were to let one second equal a year, it would take 254 years to complete this. If we let one second equal 100 years, it would take two and a half years. Um, Oh, excuse me. Yeah, take, if we let us, yeah, it would take two and a half years. So 100 years is like a generous human lifespan. lifespan. And you can imagine trillions of lives blinking on and off like little strobe lights throughout both galaxies with all their romances and heartbreaks, triumphs and tragedies, wars fought over little bits of territory and little ideas. If we let one second equal a thousand years, it would take about three months to complete this, which is, you know, a thousand years lifespan of civilization. So we have Mesopotamia, Egypt, Rome modern era, clicking along every second for three months. Also, this seems to be the frequency with which major religions are founded, most degenerating soon after they're founding into the fundamentalist belief that they have a monopoly on truth and everyone else is doomed. Um, if we let a second equal 10,000 years, it would take about 10 days. Modern humans are believed to have originated around 250,000 years or about 25 seconds ago. Uh, if the second equals 100,000 years, it would take a day to complete the merger. It's about the cycle of ice ages. If the second equals a million years, it would take about two hours. The Permian mass extinction happened 250 million years, or about four minutes ago, due to CO2 from volcanoes in Siberia causing global warming. Killed about 90% of all life on Earth, especially the larger species. Here we go. If we let a second equal 10 million years, we complete it in 13 minutes. I still don't have time, but 13 minutes would do it. 
At this speed, continents would be visibly shifting, mountains rising and eroding, 100 ice ages would be scrubbing the Earth each second, meteors and asteroids pounding the planet. The age of Earth is about 4.7 billion years. Incidentally, if I outstretch my arms like this, one swipe of the nail file would eliminate human history, if that represents 4.7 billion years. In about 5 billion years, or about 7 minutes at this rate, the sun will become a red giant and consume the Earth after turning it into a molten blob. At this point, global warming skeptics will concede that the Earth is warming. <laughs> <laughs> but still it says that it's not due to human activity. <laughs> I'm just kidding. The human race that we would recognize it will probably be gone in a second or two at this rate. But other intelligent races will evolve because it's the nature of a universal intelligence to evolve itself into forms through which it can enjoy itself as a living reality. As large and long as this merger will be, in the big picture, it's only a really brief, tiny local event, and it's dwarfed by the eternity and unboundedness of the self. I'm going to go with some quick size comparisons here. If you shrank the sun down to the size of a white blood cell and shrank the Milky Way galaxy down to the same scale, the Milky Way would be about the size of the United States. That's because the Milky Way galaxy is huge. This is where we live in it. All the stars you see at night are in this little circle, the little yellow circle. But even our galaxy is a little runt compared to some other galaxies. Um, here's the Milky Way compared to several of them. Within the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, there are approximately 10,000 galaxies. And that total view there represents only about one ten billionth of the total sky. Here's the local galactic supergroup, the Virgo supercluster, super local superclusters, and the observable universe. Srimad Bhagavanta says, there are innumerable universes besides this one, and although they are unlimitedly large, they move about like atoms in you. Therefore, you are called unlimited. You may have been referring to Krishna since it's the Srimad Bhagavatam, but there's no distinction. This discussion of vastness of the universe is like discussing the Pacific Ocean without considering its depth. The universe is multidimensional, and whether we consider dark matter in terms of physics or subtle realms in terms of spirituality, most of what exists is beyond the limits of ordinary perception. The church fought the idea for centuries that the earth was not that the fought the idea that the earth was not the center of the universe because it made us seem less important. Each successive discovery of how large the universe is has caused some people to become depressed. We feel that we are an insignificant speck in a cold, mechanistic vastness. But you would only feel this if you were egocentric, if you felt that this body is all that you are. But again, we are infinite intelligence. Every new discovery of how vast the universe is should make us even more appreciative of how vast God, our true self, is. So this vast universal perspective does not negate or diminish our personhood. Some teachers emphasize over and over that you are not a person, there is no one home, there is nothing to do, and no one to do it. I would say, courtesy of Francis again, that of course you're a person. You're just not only a person. The fact that you are the ocean doesn't mean that you aren't also a wave. You're both. Brahman, the totality, includes both absolute and relative, and both are full. Some say that since we're not a person, we don't have free will. Ultimately, this may be true, but knowledge is different in different states of consciousness, and we can't live our lives based on an intellectual concept of a state of consciousness we're not living. I would venture to guess that that's what 99% of the people who say this sort of thing are trying to do. So if you perceive yourself as having free will, then exercise it to the best of your ability. As the Gita puts it, the Dharma of another brings danger. Um, I've covered mostly the larger than large, the, the smaller than the smallest stuff in points already, but I just want to say something about atoms. The number of atoms in a gram, a gram of hydrogen is such that if you expanded them to the size of unpopped popcorn kernels, they would cover the continental United States nine miles deep. That's just one gram of hydrogen. Um, and each of these atoms is functioning with perfect orderliness in accordance with a variety of natural laws, both within itself and in relationship to all the other atoms, Again, the expression of infinite, all-pervading intelligence, which is our essential nature. Incidentally, atoms are huge compared to subatomic particle, particles, and infinite intelligence manages those perfectly, too. Most of our atoms have been through the life cycle of several stars. That's how they were formed. Atoms are so numerous that there are about a billion of them in each of our bodies that were also in the body of Shakespeare, Christ, Buddha, but not Elvis, and... <laughs> Not Justin Bieber. 
But the reason for that is it takes me a while to distribute. <laughs> so, in conclusion to part four, everything that we can observe, near or far, large or small, reveals infinite intelligence at play, and we are nothing other than that intelligence. So, part five, in three minutes, what are the practical implications of all this? Martin Buber wrote a book called I and Thou, and one of the major themes of the book is that all our relationships bring us ultimately into relationship with God, who is the eternal Thou. But I think we can take it a step further. Ultimately, we have an I and I relationship with the universe because there's only one reality. The Gita says, one sees the self in all beings and all beings in the self. Christ said, I am my Father of one. He also said, in so much as he did it unto one of these, one of these is my brethren, he, he, he did it unto me. So all lives matter. Life is precious because it's God embodied. By clear-cutting the rainforest, we're destroying our own lungs, literally. By polluting the water, the rivers and oceans, we're poisoning our own blood. By exterminating species, we're lopping off our own fingers and toes. The sixth great mass extinction is well underway. It's the first man made one. 150 to 200 species go extinct every day. If global temperatures rise by 6 degrees centigrade, which some authorities say is likely, these extinct species will include the human. So if we are the intelligence governing the universe, then why is the world so screwed up? Why are our lives so often screwed up? Or are they? From one perspective, everything is perfect just as it is. There's some Zen guy who said, you know, you're all perfect just as you are, but you can use improvement. Um, <laughs> um, if life is problematic, perhaps it's because we're not in tune with our essential nature. Christ said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They know not what they do because they know not what they are. If you know yourself only partially, then the products of your mind and heart will not reflect totality. Partial reflections of pure intelligence will produce mixed effects. Something will be accomplished while unwittingly some harm will be done. Partial knowledge in our individual lives results in mistakes which cause suffering. When partial individual knowledge on a mass scale is expressed through governments, wars are fought. When it is expressed through corporations, harmful technologies and products are produced. The more fundamental the level of nature's functioning, the more powerful it is. The molecular is more powerful than the mechanical. The atomic is more powerful than the molecular. Therefore, the more fundamentally we tinker with nature's functioning, the more critical it is that that the uh, more critical it is that we know ourselves as the intelligence governing nature, the home of all the laws of nature. Genetic engineering is an example of messing with a very basic level of nature, critical to all life, which we understand very partially. If we screw up on that level, the ramifications could be catastrophic and irreversible. I just want to say one final point here. The drill baby drill crowd says that if we extract all the oil and gas we know about, the U.S. can be energy self-sufficient for at least 100, 100 years. Environmentalists say that if we burn all that oil and gas, humans won't be around in 100 years. I say that there's not really an energy shortage, there's an intelligence shortage. Every individual in every country is sitting on an infinite reservoir of intelligence, and if enough of us begin to extract it, societies will become less wasteful and more conscious of the consequences of their actions, marvelous technological solutions will emerge, and small-minded opposition to them will evaporate. So how do we realize our true nature is infinite intelligence? Where do we find it? Remember, it's all pervading, so the easiest place to find it might be right here, one's heart. God may be omnipotent, but he's also omnipresent, so the one thing he can't do is remove himself from your heart. Once he is found there, eventually he can be found everywhere. I'd like to um, play a song for you now, which I didn't get to play in my original presentation. This was written by a friend, and my wife Irene sings backup. It's from the, or harmonies, it's from the Chandogya Upanishad.
want to call your attention to one line in that song. Uh, For the universe is in him, and he dwells within our heart. That means our heart contains the universe. They say we live in a holographic universe. In a holograph, each part contains the whole. Everything is essentially infinite. How much infinity does it take to contain the universe? The whole is contained in each of the parts. I also wanted to end on a conclude on kind of a devotional note at the end. Non-duality is sometimes presented in rather dry, heartless tones. But the great non duelists were anything but dry. They were also great bhaktas, devotees. Why? Because it's inevitable in the course of one's spiritual development. We have hearts, and the heart enjoys the sweetness, even the ecstasy of love and devotion. Shankara, founder of Advaita Vaisnava, said, the intellect imagines duality for the sake of devotion, and he wrote beautiful devotional poetry. Ramana was devoted to Arunachal, and Sargadatta sang bhajans and did pujas. So I think we can look forward to our hearts blossoming more and more as we grow in appreciation of the ultimate non-dual nature of everything. I've tried to express in this talk the notion that consciousness or God is the sole reality and that we are waves on the, that we are that reality and also as individuals we're waves on the ocean of that reality. But that all sounds rather intellectual. Um, I'd like to play a song now which I think expresses the sentiment that one who is experiencing that, not just understanding it, might feel. It's a beautiful song by Peter Mayer called Holy Now. When I was a boy each week On Sunday we would go to church And pay attention to the priest And he would read the holy word And consecrate the holy bread And everyone would kneel and bow Today the only difference is Everything is holy now Everything Everything, everything is holy now And when I was in Sunday school We would learn about the time Moses split the sea in two Jesus made the water wine And I remember feeling sad Miracles don't happen still but Now I can't keep track Cause everything's a miracle Everything, everything, everything's a miracle Wine from water is not so small Better magic trick is that anything is here at all. So the challenging thing becomes not to look for miracles, to find in where there isn't one. When holy water was rare at best, it barely wet my fingertips. Now I have to hold my breath Like I'm swimming in a sea of air It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But I walk it with a reverend air Cause everything is holy now Testament that'd be very hard to say. See another new morning come. Say it's not a sacrament. I tell you that it can't be done.
This morning outside I stood I saw a little red winged bird Shining like a burning bush And singing like a scripture verse It made me want to bow my head I remember when church let out How things have changed since then Everything is holy now It used to be a world half there Heaven's second rate hand me down But I walk it with a reverend air Cause everything is holy now Final point, for those who feel their spiritual evolution is retarded, or that it's finished, or who run into some teacher who claims to be finished, this is a quote from St. Teresa of Avila. She said, it appears that God himself is on the journey. Thank you.